All right. Good morning. Welcome to our panel on science uh, and science diplomacy in climate and energy. I'm Michael Martin. I'm a current AAAS fellow at the Department of Energy and the organizer of this panel. So I'm just going to go ahead and give a quick introduction to all the panelists and turn it over to them. Our first panelist is Dr. Robert Marley, who is currently director of the Office of International Science and Technology Collaboration at the Department of Energy. He's also the United States director of the US-China Clean Energy Research Center. Dr. Marley has held multiple roles in the Department of Energy, and prior to that, he was a, a United States Naval officer, rising to the rank of Rear Admiral. He has a PhD in nuclear engineering from MIT and a bachelor's in engineering from Duke and is a, tri and is a AAAS fellow. Our second speaker will be Radha Mutia, who is chief executive officer of the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, which has a goal of 100 million uh, uh, clean, uh, clean households adopting clean cookstoves and fuels by 2020. She comes to this role after holding a variety of positions with CARE International, ICF International, and the Council on Foreign Relations. She has a Master's of Business Administration from Stanford and holds a Bachelor's and Master's in Economics from Tufts University. Our third speaker is Dr. Scott Martin, who is the Gordon McKay Professor of Environmental Chemistry at Harvard, where he's also Director of the Laboratory for Environmental Chemistry, which researches air and water pollution issues and their effects on climate change. He's also director of the Harvard Environmental Chamber and was the lead foreign scientist on the Amazonian aerosol characterization experiment. He holds a doctorate from Caltech and, uh, and a bachelor's from Georgetown, which makes this a homecoming for him. Our and this, uh, this panel will be moderated by Dr. Jennifer Turner, uh, who is the director of the China Environmental Forum at the Woodrow Wilson Center, which focuses on environmental challenges in, uh, in water and energy in China. She is also the leader of the Global Choke Point Initiative, which looks at water, energy, food issues in China, India, Mexico, South Africa, and the United States. She holds a PhD in public policy and comparative politics from Indiana University, Bloomington. So I'll turn this over to Dr. Turner. Okay, good. Thank you so much, Michael. And hey, glad to have all of you here. We're looking for a lively session. And uh, kind of in the spirit, one, one thing that stuck out with me in, in, the, in the keynote was talking about how widening the circle of science diplomacy. So we're widening it up here. We've got government, international NGO, and an academic. Smart guy, but who's also tromping out in the field in Amazonia. So we're going to start off with, uh, with Robert. Oh, and I'm a think tank person, right? So um, you two can go down so you can see Robert's um, performance. Right. Slides. And, there, and your slides. And here you go. OK. Oh, and your job out here in the audience is to ask really difficult questions, humor. And they, these, they, they have a propensity for puns, I think, these guys. So you can give it back to us. Thank you. So thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Michael, for uh, introducing me. Um, I am Bob Marley. I'm not the reggae singer that you may have heard of, is that, uh, um, but I love his music. Um, I'm with the U.S. Department of Energy, and uh, I have a number of jobs in the Office of International Affairs. Uh, this U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center is one, is that I'll mention Mission Innovation, which is a new initiative that came out of the Paris COP. Uh, and uh, I've been uh, uh, there for quite a long time, kind of looking at this intersection between science and diplomacy. The Department of Energy is essentially a science agency. Um, we, of course, are responsible for the national laboratory system in the United States. Uh, we're one of the largest funders of uh, the physical sciences, uh, particularly in physics and, uh, and uh, um, uh, a lot of the engineering and energy and uh, mathematics, computational sciences, but surprisingly also a lot in the life sciences. Uh, so uh, we're definitely in the science business. Uh, you might be surprised, though, that uh, uh, we are also uh, very much in the uh, international diplomacy business. Now, I do may, may need some help to oh, get sorry. my slide up. So, uh, Michael's, yeah. he'll be the clicker man. I'm not sure from the screen yes. how to bring that up. <coughs> there it is. <coughs> All right, great. So I thought I would start off uh, with my few minutes here with uh, what I consider to be uh, a rather uh, memorable 
uh, historic uh, maneuver. Uh, for those of you about my age, uh, this was a real shock uh, to see that uh, China, which had been very isolated at the time, uh, there was a lot of tension between the United States and China in global affairs. Uh, to have Henry Kissinger, President Nixon's uh, science advisor, uh, not science advisor, but the national security advisor, actually feign sickness in a trip to Pakistan, uh, board a plane, uh, fly deep into China in the middle of the night, and have a meeting there uh, with officials in China that began to open the door for President Nixon to go there. Uh, and. Uh, <clears throat> They opened the door for negotiations, uh, and about eight years later, in 1979, uh, all three of the major players there, including Mao, uh, had departed uh, their official duties. Uh, but uh, science and technology cooperation was really the first manifestation of uh, the opening and normalization of relations in 1979. And, uh, here is a picture uh, from the archives, uh, you know, of President Carter uh, signing that agreement uh, in 1979. And uh, the topics that were uh, permitted under that agreement, uh, you can see them there, energy, agriculture, and space, health and environment, earth sciences, engineering, uh, scholarly exchanges of, uh, of students and, uh, and faculty. And uh, this really began a, a new era of uh, science and technology cooperation between the two countries. Uh, and uh, uh, we're still today operating under that 1979 agreement. And in my field, in energy, you can see the topics there. Uh, but uh, going beyond China now is that uh, it turns out in my business, uh, almost every country uh, in the world now, particularly emerging economies, are concerned with the kinds of things that relate to energy, climate change, uh, urban pollution. Uh, they want uh, lots of energy. Uh, many people who have uh, been in the lower echelons of society are aspiring now to uh, much better lives and they're being enabled to do so and a lot of that is being powered by energy so there's huge demand for that and this opens up uh, enormous opportunities really for the US government uh, to form relationships with uh, uh, with countries that may not have existed before and uh, and and do it through uh, mutually beneficial arrangements uh, on research and development on, on clean energy which I'm going to talk about so this is what I said about the surprise. We are a science agency. We do a lot of research. This is our main business, but you might be surprised to know that we have s and agreements, uh, over 400 of them uh, of an international nature. We're working with 80 countries plus and uh, eight international organizations such as uh, UNEP and the International Energy Agency and, and others. Uh, and, uh, all four of our mission areas are contributing in these ways. You heard Rose Gottmeller, who used to work at the Department of Energy this morning as a keynoter. Uh, you know, she mentioned a, a lot of the nonproliferation and nuclear national security issues, but uh, we're also working on an awful lot of the clean energy. And uh, through those things is that uh, in mutually beneficial programs, we're advancing these strategic objectives of, uh, of energy, uh, the economy, and the environment. Uh, this is the map of the world where all those countries are, is that uh, uh, noticeably uh, we're not doing too much work with Greenland, although I'd have to look into that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, also you can see that uh, because of some governance issues, uh, you know, with some of the governments in some of these countries, it really is not uh, possible to create a, a really, truly productive uh, uh, research arrangement, uh, you know, when uh, some of the instabilities interfere with these things. So there are some blanks on the pages, but it, it's certainly a broad world map. <clears throat> so what I would like to do uh, is uh, pivot now to one of the things that I'm working on is kind of an exemplar. We can get into some details. Uh, this is with uh, 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 China. Uh, and uh, this is a presidential initiative uh, started with President uh, Hu Jintao uh, when President Obama first uh, was inaugurated uh, in his first year in 2009. And uh, it's since uh, been uh, reinvigorated and re-supported by President uh, Xi Jinping in China. And, and here are some pictures of that. And uh, this thing is called the US-China Clean Energy Research Center. Uh, we have uh, four technical tracks that are working right now. One is on uh, clean vehicles, 
with a big focus on electrification, another one on building energy efficiency. Uh, the Chinese, uh, in particular, are building out infrastructure in urban areas. Uh, it used to be, uh, uh, I think, uh, one New York City every three years, if you can imagine. I think it's slowed down a little bit, so maybe it's one Chicago every three years. Uh, but still, it's a very <laughs> impressive infrastructure build out. Uh, since a lot of that infrastructure is not yet built, is that certainly we have a lot of leverage on how to make those buildings as efficient as possible. Another one is on the advanced coal technology with carbon capture, utilization, and storage. And uh, we have recently uh, awarded uh, uh, a large uh, contract uh, through a competitive solicitation to the University of California uh, system. Uh, which includes a, a number of the, uh, of the campuses in that system uh, to do something on energy and water. Of course, we have partners in China that are collaborating with us on all of those tracks, and we are in the process right now of uh, soliciting uh, proposals for something on heavy-duty trucks. And uh, we're very fortunate to have, actually, uh, some people in the audience uh, who are very familiar with this uh, from China. They're from the embassy here in town. Those are our goals on the left-hand side. I won't uh, belabor them. So uh, this is a talk about the intersection between science and diplomacy. It's not a talk about research, per se. But uh, I can't really get past the moment. This is a research project. We've been going on now for five years. And we really have some uh, stunning results that are coming out. I think we had an audit by the General Accounting Office, you know, uh, no good deed in Washington goes uh, unpunished, as they say. Is that uh, so? We've had a lot of scrutiny, uh, and uh, and it's been a very good relationship with GAO on the investigation of this project, and uh, we've cataloged over 44 significant research outcomes uh, from these three tracks. And I show you some pictures here, which may whet your appetite. I know we have uh, scientists or at least aspiring scientists in the audience, uh, not just diplomats and aspiring diplomats. Uh, so uh, one of them is with the Advanced Coal Technology Consortium, and uh, this is a picture of uh, Gibson 3, uh, a coal power plant uh, in Indiana operated by Duke Energy. And we had another uh, counterpart in uh, the Huanang Group uh, in Shanghai, uh, really coming up with a world-class uh, post-combustion capture process. Uh, I can go into that story uh, showing really the benefit of having a substantial partner in the other country that is offering a platform for our researchers to gain operational data, uh, simulate, and then basically take some of that technology under a framework of protected IP back to the United States and, and benefit. So this is, uh, and you'll hear me talk about this theme periodically, this is not uh, foreign aid. It's not tech transfer. It's not uh, the United States, uh, uh, you know, giving something away to another country. It really is forming uh, value propositions that are mutually beneficial to both countries uh, and, uh, and how that uh, benefit flows uh, both ways. And that's just a, a really good example. This other building in the middle is the Chinese Academy of Building Research. It used to be a, an old-time brick building that was uh, very inefficient, and it's now a model of a nearly zero uh, net zero energy building. And uh, the United States uh, companies that were partnering in our research program, uh, at least four or five of them were able to demonstrate some of their cutting edge technologies uh, um, on, uh, on lighting controls, a ground source heat pump. In the front of that building, you'll have uh, 170 holes that go down uh, an average of 100 meters apiece. That's a long way down, uh, you know, with uh, taking ground out of the water, uh, heat out of the groundwater and, uh, and uh, uh, heating the building uh, in the wintertime and uh, actually assisting in the cooling in the summertime. Uh, and many, many other examples. And then the final one there is a picture of uh, how automobiles are built today. Uh, they're built <coughs> with many, many different kinds of materials. It's not just steel and aluminum and glass. You've got all kinds of man-made materials, uh, you know, uh, fiber, uh, uh, carbon fiber, strengthened materials, uh, all kinds of plastics. And the question is, is that when you put all these things together in a car, what is the roadworthiness of that in terms of a safety or a crash test? Uh, well, you can build one of these things and crash it and find out. Uh, that would be a very expensive proposition with all the combinations that there are, or you can simulate it. And, uh, and in a, a, a really good project um, featuring a really excellent work by Chinese graduate students and postdocs in China, uh, millions and millions of lines of code, uh, build a simulation model, which is now being used by uh, you know, our 
uh, companies here in the United States uh, to um, uh, simulate how to put these things together safely. So those are just some examples. So pardon my discretion, I just had to really talk about research before going on to kind of the theme of the, of the conference. Uh, when we started out on this project five years ago, we really tried to figure out how to raise, elevate uh, this model of uh, science and technology cooperation to a new level. Uh, we had a wonderful opportunity. We had a five-year run, uh, and what could we do with that? And there's nothing wrong with the left-hand side of this chart, is that uh, this is what I would call kind of the traditional cooperative method of science and technology. Uh, lots of academic exchanges. Uh, they do their thing, we do our thing. We come together at conference and share information and things like that. Uh, this is very traditional and it's very valuable. However, we really wanted it to take it to the new level. And I have a lot of kind of, uh, uh, kind of con contrary examples on the other side. Like for example, work plans are coordinated, but they're really still separate. What we do with the money that we have is that we get together and we form a joint work plan and we develop that work plan jointly and we divide the labor and we really have an interdependency and depend on the other side to actually do their part to make our side successful and vice versa. This creates a much more intimate uh, relationship for research and development and really inspires uh, after people get to know each other and they start working on these things at the scientific level, uh, relationships of trust and friendship that really begin to pay off. And even at the researcher level, it kind of grows upward. It kind of diffuses up into the very senior leadership of the agencies that are, that are overseeing these things, uh, creating a, a really good environment of, of working together. In Chinese language, the word cooperation and collaboration are kind of the same word uh, in translation. And it's, uh, it's hard to kind of like really drive this message home. But really, I kind of have resorted to uh, a visual here that uh, cooperation is like a, a handshake, uh, you know, where you're friends and you're working together and you're going to, it's, it's good, it's cooperation. But collaboration is like an interlock grip where you're actually working together and you really are very tight. So I'll, I'll let you read kind of the compare and contrast between these two things. I draw your attention maybe to the lower bullets where we do have a new regime on intellectual property. Uh, in the old days with science and technology agreements, just to make sure that it was kind of clear and uncomplicated, everything in China belonged to China, everything in the United States belonged to the United States, and nothing ever kind of crossed the barrier, otherwise you get into kind of disputes. And what we were trying to do, that's not how business really operates, is that uh, we tried to loosen those things and we actually have an annex to our protocol that uh, establishes the rules of the road on how this is going to be done, and you can't even begin work until you organize a framework uh, for operating on intellectual property, which is uh, another one here that I wanted to <coughs> show you here. Here's a signing ceremony of uh, the government officials uh, from both capitals uh, endorsing what we call a technology management plan. That is, when you're doing a project, you have to actually go through, this is like, uh, I think, 12 pages of English, Chinese, English, Chinese, English, Chinese, every single point uh, in the legal document. It's taken us over a year to negotiate this stuff and of course we could not do it just with the uh, lawyers and general counsel at DOE and uh, it really had to involve practitioners and experts uh, in IP uh, practice uh, with US and Chinese clients uh, to help us negotiate these terms and conditions. And now we have this framework, which is uh, publicly available on our website, on how we're going to operate. Now, if you didn't have protection for IP, you're going to have mediocre work, right? Because people are not going to bring their best stuff to the table. Uh, they may not bring their absolute best stuff to the table. Uh, you may never even see that, in fact, uh, because uh, there's still competitive uh, uh, forces at work. Uh, on the other hand, is that it has elevated the whole quality of research by having uh, this framework in which we work in. Apart from the research and kind of the practicalities of these tracks and how we're working together as scientists, and I would say that when you add up all of the Chinese researchers uh, on their side and all of the American researchers on our side, there's 1,100 people who are working on these, on these uh, tracks. Uh, total, we have over 100 business partners um, and uh, a lot of institutions in both countries. And I should say at the top is that the United States government, DOE, is funding the U.S. side. Uh, the Chinese government, uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology is funding the China side. And so we're both equal partners in this. That was the whole premise, is that we come together as equals. 
uh, and part of that is providing equal funding on both sides. Uh, so apart from all of that is that uh, as we got into it, we discovered that yes, the motivation was research. Yes, we were really trying to accelerate innovation on clean energy technology and then deploy it in both countries for the benefit of both countries. But we also found out that uh, really the relationships that we were spawning were very, very helpful uh, on a diplomatic level. And uh, because of the work we were doing on IP, we were defusing uh, uh, tensions, uh, we were creating uh, kind of models or exemplars of how to practice IP. Uh, you know, when you're working in China, it has the government endorses, endorsements on top, which means the players uh, abide by their framework, but if they start going outside the lines, guess what? Is that uh, the governments, uh, you know, come in and say, remind them that we've all signed this agreement and we have to comply. Uh, so you have a little bit of oversight. We don't intervene in courts, so we're not an IP protection society at that level. It's kind of uh, a preemptive. We let everybody know how we're going to do this. We're all watching, and it unfolds uh, properly. And then finally, we have business partners. On our side, everything is cost-shared, and we have uh, quite a few uh, business partners. And it turns out that the relationships that they build uh, spill over into market access in both ways. And uh, this has been very beneficial, like that example I mentioned on the Chinese Academy of Building Research, which, by the way, is a great building in which to demonstrate your technologies because these are the same people uh, who are living in these offices uh, that actually write the building codes for China, or at least advise on the technical aspects of the building codes. So I wanted to highlight these red boxes, since this is science and diplomacy. Over here, there are diplomatic outcomes that turned out, to us at least, to be surprising. And uh, here are seven of them. And uh, across the top, we have a little bit of scoreboard there. We didn't have any of these in the first year. We didn't have any in the second year. We had one uh, significant uh, kind of acknowledgement there in 2013. And then we had two in 14 that were really significant. I'm going to talk about those in a minute. And we're building on this thing. So the relationship uh, between the two countries has risen to a, a very, very good level. I mean, I can tell you that Secretary Moniz can pick up the phone and talk to, Sec to Minister Wang Gong at most uh, on a scheduled call, and they will have a very frank and forthright discussion about how two countries can benefit if we collaborate on something. Uh, the lines of communication are wide open, and we have a friendly, supportive relationship on both sides that really pays off. Uh, on the second bullet here, uh, it's just a line, but this is where uh, the head of the International Division of Most actually gave a speech in a very large uh, diplomatic setting where he said that this particular model, the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center, was the best model for bilateral collaboration since the normalization of relations in 1979. So we have very strong support in China. The other one there is, uh, you know, just uh, 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 the joint announcement. Uh, this was, this has been, this is between Xi Jinping and President Obama on climate. This happened a year before um, the COP convened. And the whole issue was is that no one's going to agree to anything if the big countries uh, from what used to be the non-annex one countries in the old framework convention language uh, weren't playing. So how do you bring them into the game? It turns out that this joint statement brought China and the U.S. together on the same day uh, into the game. It's largely regarded as the key that unlocked uh, the stalemate that we had uh, over all these years on the framework convention and led to a much more successful Paris Agreement a year later. <coughs> and. Uh, in that joint announcement, if you read it, uh, you'll see that the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center is cited by name three times. This is from the presidents of the two countries. This is not from us at DOE. And uh, so you can tell that there's a link. I can't say that that was the cause. <laughs> there are lots of reasons that are motivating that kind of agreement. But the idea that that was a citation three times emphasized, I think, the importance of both countries uh, developing a very warm, friendly, supportive, trustful relationship on issues related to energy and climate. And, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more about mission innovation here. Um, these are big teams. Uh, here's a picture of just the one on vehicles. Uh, it's on a rare blue sky day in Beijing. <laughs> it was really a great picture. Uh, but this, this is uh, our annual meeting on the CERC 
Vehicles uh, Conference uh, in Beijing. And you can see here that uh, this particular initiative attracts really top talent uh, in both countries. These are really top academics, top scientists in, in knowing what they're doing. Uh, we're certainly working with Tsinghua University, which is the lead on electric vehicles in China. Uh, they have a budget of three or four hundred million U.S. dollars a year. Uh, this is about the same as DOE has in the United States. So they're bringing a lot of innovation to the table. And here is a copy of that joint agreement. Uh, all of these slides will be available, and there are links here where you can go look at these things if you want them. But besides having a huge advancement in research, uh, kind of like the Vegematic okay, commercials, uh, you know, on TV, but there's more. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, yes, research, but science and diplomacy, the diplomacy things are really kind of surprising. This has built a huge relationship of mutual respect and cooperation between the two countries, and that is spilling over into the managing of issues that are much bigger than just energy and climate. Um, and it promotes, promotes trade and defuses tensions. And uh, so you can see some of the examples here, and, the mission, and this uh, joint statement is just one manifestation of that cooperation. Uh, we have others with India. So, here is a rather extraordinary picture. Uh, you may have missed it. Uh, here are 20 leaders. These are the leaders of the countries uh, of what are really the big energy research and development funding nations of the world. 80% of uh, emissions are represented by the people on stage, uh, just about 80% of the R&D that's funded there. Uh, and these leaders on the first day, that actually the day before the COP, it was November 30th, the COP began on, uh, on, November, uh, on December 1st, um, pledged uh, to double their own clean energy R&D budgets over five years. The baseline of all of these things added together I won't say the numbers uh, are exact, but uh, at least uh, 10 billion uh, collectively. And if you were to double that, that's going to uh, be 20 billion over five years. So uh, the whole idea here is that innovation is the key uh, to an awful lot of the ambition that people are uh, displaying in their uh, INDCs. And uh, if they don't see a means to get there, <coughs> they're not gonna pledge. Innovation makes that possible because the technologies are improving la rapidly, the costs are dropping dramatically, and whether you look at LEDs or you look at PV or you look at wind or whatever you look at, these costs are coming down like this. And they hit a certain threshold, and at that point, volume for sales takes off. And it's that kind of transformation that is motivated by science, technology, and innovation, and it is done a, a heck of a lot faster if countries work together. So, in conclusion, <coughs> this is my last slide. Jennifer's looking at me. She's probably saying I'm running out of time. I always do. But basically, you know, international collaboration on science and technology, first and foremost, must be motivated by a value proposition uh, on research progress. That's how it goes. If you don't get the value out of the research, you're just not going to get the money for it. Uh, the transaction costs are higher because you're working in a different culture, you're working a different language, it's a long distance, uh, even phone calls with China, they're always 12 or 13 hours, uh, you know, uh, different. So, you know, somebody is really working late or really early <laughs> all the time you're working with them. Uh, and, uh, but at DOE, we've discovered that there are surprisingly powerful spillover effects uh, coming out of this kind of cooperation. Uh, and so we've strengthened our engagement, uh, uh, you know, on these climate negotiations. Uh, we're making a lot of progress on intellectual property, which is a sensitive issue between the two countries. If you talk to trade rep or commerce, of course, you're going to get a little bit different picture. But uh, we've got a model here that's, uh, that's kind of preemptive. Uh, you know, if we start off on the right foot, we don't have problems. Uh, and uh, uh, the businesses are clamoring to get in on some of these things because they can build relationships and start uh, seeing business opportunities in China that they didn't have before. So I'm just suggesting here as I close out, if this model works for China and this model works for India, we have another one called PACE-R that's for India, maybe the model could uh, work in other areas other than energy, maybe it could work in other country pairs. And I would just think that this would be a worthy thing to explore uh, for both science and diplomacy. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. See, as, as, 
As the director of the China Environment Forum, it's hard for me to stop someone talking good news about China stuff. My, actually, my very first publication was called Crouching Suspicions, Hidden Potential, about U.S.-China Energy and Environmental Cooperation. I've been waiting 16 years for this, and I'm so glad. All right. All right. So I'll go down there. And he will go down there, and I'm going to ask Radha to come up <coughs> and, and also tell us some stories. And they're probably some and good stories, too. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone here. And it's really great, Bob, listening to your presentation to actually follow you, because I feel like you touched on so many of the key points, innovation, science, research, diplomacy, bilateral relationships, diplomacy, how all of those can be enhanced. And I'll tell you how all of those can apply in a multilateral, I'll add two words to this, or so three words, multilateral, household, and markets. And so what I'm going to do is actually follow on Bob's story, although we didn't plan it that way, uh, but really take you now to look at how each of those words and phrases that were discussed, in addition to the three I've just mentioned, can apply to supporting real and dynamic change um, for the climate, for you know, women's empowerment, for public health, for livelihood development, especially for those at the bottom of the pyramid. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about clean energy interventions at the household level and how science and innovation have really been the, the foundation to support some of this change um, around the world. So first, let me start with just uh, getting us all on the same page in terms of the nature of this issue. Today, there are about three billion people around the world who are dependent on food that is cooked either over open fires or very traditional mud clay stoves. So that's three billion people, roughly 500 million families or households out there. Of these 500 million households, they have prolonged exposure to cook stove smoke. Imagine for some of you going out and camping. We do that occasionally, and you think, oh, it's sort of a fun activity for a weekend. But imagine cooking uh, over an open fire over a period of time in an enclosed setting with, a, with poor ventilation, and you're exposed to that smoke day in and day out. What that results in is 4.3 million deaths annually. This is not a total over a certain number of years. This is every year. Bob just talked about China. Half a million of those deaths are in China. A million of those deaths are in India. The rest are Sub-Saharan Africa, Bangladesh, et cetera, um, and, and a few in, in uh, Central America. So this isn't an issue that discriminates. I can't tell you this is only in these two economies in the world. No, this is prevalent across many, many countries around our world. So that's the public health burden. 4.3 million deaths, a large number are children because of the smoke and the uh, it's the number one cause of pneumonia for kids under the age five in, in the developing world. But it also is a significant climate and environmental issue and a number of, uh, for a number of reasons. There's one statistic here. 25% of the world's black carbon comes from cook stove smoke. So it's not something that's small. People often think if it's a household level issue, it can't possibly you know, a, be, be a large statistic when it comes to the global stage, but it is because of those 500 million households that we're talking about. To go further, a statistic that's not on here is the level of deforestation. A lot of women are cooking with either wood, some other form of agricultural waste, or charcoal. Depending on the equation in different countries, it can take six to eight kilograms of wood to produce one kilogram of charcoal. So think about the levels of deforestation that are caused by that and resulting land degradation, so lack of productivity of that land. And again, the world's poor is quite dependent on you know, basic uh, subsistence agriculture as well. Now, the costs are significant to our society. It's a World Bank study that estimated $123 billion in annual costs to health, the environment, et cetera, if we don't deal with this problem. So I just wanted to set the stage there with some of the statistics. Now, no surprise, girls and women are most affected. They're the ones who do most of the cooking. They're the ones who go out to collect the fuel. Um, so in terms of, again, the averages by country can vary, but if you take a global number, it's about eight hours a day not including sleeping time, so eight hours of sort of the waking hours, if you will, that are spent on the collection of fuel and inefficient cooking. We all know if you're cooking outside or, you know, it takes much longer to cook, you know, any kind of food that, that you're cooking. So it's a substantial drain on women's time in addition, and the opportunity cost of that time, in addition to their health and, and, and climate-related issues. 
So the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves that I represent um, is an interesting partnership that was developed in 2010, in fact launched by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, um, to address this issue that um, impacts public health, therefore saves lives, impacts our environment and climate, impacts women in terms of their ability and, and capacity to make choices to do other things with their time, and also protects the environment at the same time. Now, it's not to say there were not many, many projects on cookstoves over the last several decades hundreds, hundreds all over the world. Why was the Global Alliance formed? It was formed because of the notion that you needed multiple different types of actors to come together in partnership to comprehensively address this issue and to create lasting sustainable change. So just a minute here, we've had lots of scientists, lots of academics, lots of researchers, lots of businesses innovating and trying to develop cookstoves, doing their work over the last couple of decades, but all working somewhat in their own fields without this cross-pollination occurring. And what you'll see now, and, and why the alliance was launched, was really to ensure there was this partnership and cross-pollination from academics to researchers to, um, to you know, financiers to you know, uh, manufacturers, distributors, governments, etc. all had a unique role to play to actually enable this lasting end impact that, um, that, that we're looking to have. So our model is an interesting one. The next three slides that I have talk about what's different about how it used to work before versus the model that, that is working now. In the past, you'd have a donor government, whether it was the you know, UK government through DFID, the US government through USAID, providing a big grant that would essentially enable you know, a handout of cook stoves in various communities around the world. But now what we're doing is we're taking much more of a market-based approach. So the idea here is the cook stove and fuel are essentially appliances. They're household appliances. If people are to value these appliances, they will probably pay a little bit for these appliances if they value what the end um, outcome is. And you, we've seen that throughout the base of the pyramid populations. People are willing to pay for things that they see some value from. They just need to understand what that value is and actually be able to see those benefits as well. So the biggest difference and the approach that we've been taking over the last few years is applying this market lens to this effort. So when applying a market lens, you say, okay, to enable a market, you want to strengthen the supply of product through innovation, have better quality products that are combusting you know, the fuel much more cleanly and therefore limiting the emissions that come out from these stoves. You want to ensure that you've got strong supply chains at the last mile that are able to have local production, local distribution, local after-sales service, all of those types of things. And you want to have finance both for enterprises to not just produce 200 stoves a month, but 200,000 stoves a month to meet this big need that's out there. And you want to have inclusive value chains. This isn't a global north will do for the global south, but much more kind of engagement within those value chains of community members in many of these communities, and women in particular, because women shouldn't be sort of the recipients of the end product in this case. But we've, <laughs> we have research that shows when women design cook stoves and women sell these cook stoves, they outsell their main counterparts three to one. Women prefer buying a woman's product from other women. You know, women can help them uh, understand how to use the stove, how to use it most efficiently, how to cook your favorite foods and traditional foods on it, etc. So including women within this value chain is a key part of how we work as well. Obviously, there's the enhancing demand part, creating awareness, ensuring accessibility. The poor aren't going to use these stoves if they're just available in Nairobi. They have to be available in their local village marketplaces as well. And obviously, they have to be affordable. And that's where innovation and science come together very well. How do you really innovate and mass produce and create products that are affordable but have the scientific properties that will reduce emissions to improve public health, to improve our environments, to, to mitigate climate change as well? So there's a huge role for scientists here, but in combination with the business minds and financial minds that need to come and play to really create the end impact that we're looking for. Now, this is a nascent sector. It's a very, very new industry, if you will, in terms of thinking of it as an industry. And so an enabling environment is, is essential to this. So you know, having government support through enabling environment policies, supportive research, st effective standards and testing. One of my colleagues at the Global Alliance is a AAAS fellow and has really supported all of our work with ISO to develop global testing standards for cook stoves. If you're going to make this a sector and an industry like any other, it has to 
have standards so that anybody from an investment banker to a user can line up five stoves across a table and say, if I'm interested in public health benefits, which stove should I go for? The standards will help determine that. Versus, I am you know, I can't afford that. Public health isn't the driver for me. I'm interested in efficiency, not using as much charcoal to burn my stove. And I can only pay $10 for that stove. Again, the standards help define what, what you're likely to get out of each stove as well. So that's what's different here. It's a very different approach that we're taking to addressing this development and environment issue. Now, the other important issue, because it's a market-based approach, is you want to have choice for the consumer. No consumer wants to be told, here, this is good for you, please use it. It doesn't work. We've seen that, whether in this sector or in other sectors. In particular, in this area when it comes to cooking, uh, you do want to have choice. Many women around the world feel like, oh, if I'm in Accra, Ghana, I've got to pound my fufu. This little stove that I've been given is not going to be able to allow me to do that. I need to, I need to have it portable because there's a rainy season and there's a dry season. This you know, fixed stove is not going to allow me to do that. So having choice is critical. You know, just be, and, and again, providing the best by saying, here is a modern electric you know, stove's not going to work, obviously, if people don't have access to that particular fuel, in this case, electricity. So having choice when it comes to fuels, having choice when it comes to affordable price points, having choice when it comes to, you know, I'm cooking in Jera, I need a very big um, uh, burner top, as opposed to I'm boiling water and it's fine for me to have a small burner top. So innovation is critical here in order to achieve this end impact, and choice is critical as well. Now, we've We've come together as a very interesting set of non-traditional partners working together. We now have 1,500 plus uh, organizations and country partners that are part of the alliance. They're countries, donor countries, as you see at the top. They're um, private sector NGOs, just a smattering of who those are. There, there are quite a few more. There are multilateral agencies uh, engaged in this, and then of course national implementing countries. But the majority actually are small, medium-sized enterprises, academics, researchers, scientists you know, really each working in their own way, but now seeing a clear link between once the evidence base is established and you've got clear scientific, um, you know, uh, instrumentation, precise instrumentation, you know, more cleaner burning uh, stoves, etc. they can now see how that is translated to government policy, how that's translated to manufacturing, how that's translated to implementation and use. So that full connection across the chain is what is different about what the Alliance and all of these partners are doing today versus prior efforts in the past. So the approach is generating some momentum. So we've been at this for about five years now. We're close to 49 million households. Um, at the beginning, Martin, I think, suggested that our goal was 100 million households by 2020, and we're well on our way. Many of you know that the curve is flat in the beginning as you're laying the foundation, readying the enabling environment, et cetera, but our curve gets progressively steep, and we're very confident, actually, about overshooting that 100 million household goal by, by 2020. And these are just some of the things that have been put in place, and you can see the, the differences here, you know, good strategic plans in focus countries. China is a big collaborative partner, so is India, but so is Ghana and Kenya and Guatemala. So we also have a portfolio of very different types of countries, and how we work in each is obviously quite different given the, the um, economic infrastructure, the government role, et cetera, in each of these areas. But you see things like ISO standards that I've mentioned, WHO indoor air quality standards, and then you've got behavior change efforts, you know, and we've got um, investment capital that's coming into the sector to strengthen enterprises that are producing these higher quality stoves as well. So it's a real mixture of different kinds of efforts that need to come together in order to achieve these, um, these end goals. Now, I'm going to close with two slides around how it supports our global goals. So one, one thing that was very important in 2015 was, was critical because of the Sustainable Development Goals as well as, obviously, the Climate Agreement uh, in, in Paris at the end of the year. Clean cooking can support 10, directly support 10 of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So our goal has always been to say, look, for, for countries, for governments, for others, don't think of it as a separate priority, an nth priority that you need to add to an already heavy list of things that need to be done in country, but see this as a means to an end to achieving multiple existing goals and issues, uh, priorities and targets that you have um, in country. So again, whether it's public health, in particular maternal health <coughs> and child health, whether it's envir environment protection, it's mi mitigation of climate change, um, and then clean energy, you know, and for household energy use, and, and really women's empowerment. If you can reduce that time from eight hours to hopefully two to four hours for, you know, 
you know, collection of fuel and cooking, that's four more hours that can be spent productively, whether it's, you know, applying it at a, at a job that a woman might have or taking care of her, her kids, you know, monitoring their education, et cetera. So there's significant impacts that this, you know, clean cook stove and fuel can really have. And the final slide is addressing those impacts. So with 100 million households, we do project to save 640,000 lives, 170,000 of which are children. You see the number of jobs created. This is a sector, this is an industry. Taking a market-based approach, you actually will employ quite a few people at some point or in, in the supply chain, the fuel supply chain or the cook stove supply chain. Trees, that's, it's significant. In fact, we do so many programs now where we're combining a clean cooking program with an afforestation program because the two together just really can exponentially uh, help, the, help not only preserve but can, you know, attempt to grow forest cover as well. And of course, the metric tons uh, in terms of CO2 emissions that are, um, are, are significant as well in terms of the reduction. Um, so that's where I'll, I'll end it with saying that science, technology has a critical role to play when combined with markets and, and market forces to be able to really create substantial change and improvement in, in this case at the household level in the lives and of you know, up to 3 billion people, 500 million families. So it's, it's truly a, a significant impact that uh, clean energy, in this case household energy, can have um, on, on people's lives and the environment. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to be known as the optimistic good news panel today. Let me get Michael. Um. Are you better at this than me? I can probably. Oh, you, you already got it. And I, I mean, I, I'm not going to lay out because you pretty much saw the, the parallels. I was struck how also the CERC and your program, your cook stove, it was the same year as 2010 to 2015. All right, here we go. Okay, um, let's see, I guess a good uh, late morning uh, to everyone, and uh, thank you uh, so much for organizing this session and uh, bringing us all uh, uh, together. Um, as mentioned, I'm an uh, 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 academic. My area is really kind of the physical uh, uh, sciences, so here I am among uh, some folks who have much more expertise in what you might call uh, science. Uh, diplomacy, so what's my role? My role is maybe to bring to you a, a, a raw edge and uh, tell you how it is uh, at, the, at the front line in terms of uh, implementation and experiences that, that I've had. So the, the academic begins with an idea uh, among colleagues and uh, you submit a proposal and uh, then uh, in a favorable case, uh, you get the good news. Uh, uh, wow, the project is launched and uh, you think you uh, are ready to go. Uh, and then when it's an international product uh, project, you find out that really uh, uh, the hard part is now uh, going to begin. And this is uh, kind of the science uh, diplomacy. Um, I was a principal investigator for a, a two-year project in, uh, uh, in the Amazon um, uh, Department of Energy uh, led. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about uh, the implementation of that project in terms of interaction with uh, Brazil side um, uh, colleagues, agencies, approvals, uh, uh, so on uh, and so forth. Um, my idea here, uh, as I think I have to tell you a little bit about the project first, uh, and then after I tell you a little about the project, I will tell you uh, a little about what uh, have been my uh, trials by fire with science uh, diplomacy. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, it worked out. That's why I'm here to speak with you uh, today. But uh, uh, during the course of events, that was not always uh, uh, clear. Okay, so. <laughs> The uh, project, uh, Go Amazon, Green Ocean uh, Amazon. Amazon is about uh, two-thirds the size of the continental United States. Um, it has one major city in the center of it, um, which is Manaus, uh, two million uh, people. So pause for a second and think of the United States before we cut down the forests in Indiana, Ohio, uh, Illinois, and think of just one large city, say St. Louis in the middle of it, and you get, you get the idea. There's Manaus, uh, the closest uh, large other city is about 2,000 kilometers away, surrounded by uh, uh, this forest. Okay, um, this city in and of itself is, is interesting uh, in that uh, it was founded, uh, well, it's founded a long time ago, but the, it became a free trade zone uh, under the government in the 1960s, um, and there's been internal migration on the order of 50,000 people uh, uh, since then. So it's grown uh, 50,000 people per year. So it's grown very uh, rapidly. And normally sitting in uh, the Amazon outside of pollution um, with respect to climate change, you need to know initial and current. And current is kind of 2016. 
but how you judge change, you need to know year 1750. So the idea behind the Amazon is one of the last remaining continental large areas that under clean conditions uh, uh, has lower influence from human activities. So as we sit downwind of the city of Manaus, about 70 kilometers downwind, when that pollution plume, which is in the trade winds, uh, hits us, we're in the year 2016. When that pollution plume migrates a little bit to the north, a little bit to the south, we're in the year 1750. And so we can really contrast uh, the function of clouds, rainfall, aerosol, chemistry, um, when we're in the plume, when we're out of the plume, in order to begin to understand the impact of uh, human activities on ecosystems, uh, air quality, climate functioning. And that was kind of the context of, of what we were doing. So just to give you a sense of, 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 the, uh, of the data, here's this uh, city of Manaus. And wind time, about four hours downwind here, which was uh, where one of our major sites uh, was deployed. This is an aircraft, a DOE aircraft. Um, and uh, this is the flight track of the aircraft at that particular time. And what you're looking at in the z-axis is a total particle number concentration. And so what impressions you is there is this large plume of going fr uh, from Manaus with the winds downwind, and you can see background, and if I showed you the numbers, it's about 300 particles per cubic centimeter, and this is about 30,000 particles uh, per cubic uh, centimeter. Um, as our previous speaker mentioned, this has uh, uh, health issues, air quality, but it also has affects clouds, uh, climate, uh, rainfall, uh, and this, this plume, which at this time is going in its kind of standard way and intersecting our site, would, depending on the given meteorology of the day, go a little bit to the north or a little bit to the south, so we'd get, sometimes get polluted air masses, sometimes get clean air masses. And we kind of call this a natural laboratory. Okay, sounds great. Okay, how to make it happen. Um, uh, we're, we're approved by DOE, I get the call, um, and uh, now we have to uh, think about uh, the, the, uh, the implementation. Um, as you might uh, uh, expect, um, there are some challenges. Okay, so the, the first thing we, we really had to know is what are our goals once we, once we got the call. We wanted to have an American aircraft flying in Brazilian airspace. Um, we wanted to have, this is, was, uh, this is a, a farm. Um, it looked like this. Um, we got, as part of the course of the project, got isolated. We brought in containers. So we had to uh, identify a site, uh, contract with a landowner. Um, get uh, research containers uh, through uh, customs and, in a favorable case, back out, okay, uh, to stay there for two years. This is kind of looking at it from the ground. So all of this has to come in and all of this has to go, to go uh, out. All right, so we knew what our goals were. Um, and then the next thing was to kind of know uh, the requirements. What do we have to do in order to make that uh, happen? Well, we need a scientific license. Um, on the Brazil side, this means going through the equivalent of their National Science Foundation and then through their Ministry of Science, Technology, uh, and in, in Innovation. Um, uh, in the end, uh, we're trying to get uh, something that essentially gets published in the Federal Registrar. It looks like this, uh, Giari Oficial, um, and you see some names down here. Um, but if you want to get a visa, then uh, you need to have your name uh, come out uh, in this. And as you can see, this requires going to Brasilia and a number of uh, approvals. Uh, and so uh, what this is adding up to is thinking ahead, time. Um, your name needs to be here. This is kind of a, you know, lots of little problems, but if you have a graduate student and you don't yet know who your graduate student is, this was, came out in 2012, the project's gonna start in 2014, um, there's a bit of a disconnect uh, there. If you have uh, um, uh, uh, scientists who uh, change jobs, another uh, bit of disconnect there. But we needed this. Um, that was okay. We knew how to write a proposal. Um, uh, we knew how to get it into uh, the system. Um, what was a little daunting, though, was when we were told we needed a presidential decree in order to fly a foreign aircraft. So I'm there in my office in Cambridge and thinking, how is Jilma Rousseff going to be become aware of our project and, and <laughs> sign this piece of paper that we need? Okay, so that, was, that one kept us busy for, for a little while. Um, uh, a land contract. Um, uh, so we had to identify the site, negotiate. Um, that went through the lawyers. It was a private, private uh, owner. He uh, uh, let us use the land for a dollar. Um, and then, of course, there's a data agreement, meaning, uh, um, um, uh, and I would just mention, incidentally, the data agreement was very important on the DOE side because it had previously deployed into uh, China, and the data agreement there was a very big discussion. But different cultures, um, though the data agreement was actually quite easy with Brazil, um, Brazilians have a law, um, you keep a copy of data in Brazil, the end. 
Um, so that was something that from a previous experience had been quite difficult, but in this experience was quite easy. But on the other hand, the other things were challenging, like the presidential uh, uh, decree, for example. Okay, so after you kind of know the requirements, um, then you want to understand uh, the process, um, how, this, how this can happen. All right, so there was actually the Go Amazon was mentioned, for example, in Obama and Jill Rousseff when they met several times. It was in one of their, uh, well, a line item, a line item. That sounds great. Um, we talked about a memorandum of understanding, um, but you know, we actually decided, I was, I was a scientist, we were a team, we had goals, and we started to explore this kind of high level get complicated. Um, different folks in the US wanted to use it for different purposes. Different folks in Brazil wanted to use it for different purposes. We kind of made the call to go the other way around. We were just going to do it in the trenches. That means we went through our Brazil colleagues um, uh, and the Brazilian institutions, and they made the case through their normal process uh, to uh, Brazilian authorities about why this was in the Brazilian national interest, and this was a Brazilian experiment. Um, and, and so we can, uh, though we had those high level approve, uh, interest, interest from the two presidents, uh, we realized that that was actually going to be, going at that high level, it's actually going to be more complicated and take more time, and going through the trenches um, led by the Brazilians was a much better way uh, to do it for our, for our purposes. But there was that decision moment during the course of uh, the project about which way uh, uh, to go, and uh, um, Right, okay, and so also understanding the process, it's very important to know uh, the culture that you're going to and, and speaking with people. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a trite statement to say when you show up as an American uh, and begin a conversation, uh, you're at a bias with respect to arrogance, right? That's kind of the, that's kind of the obvious statement, so we all know to be, to be humble and get past, that, get past that bias. But things that, you know, you don't know, um, you know, if, don't be rude, you know, uh, that's very important in Brazilian culture, don't be rude. If you're in the U.S., you can be brusque sometimes and people will even respect you for it, but in the U.S., I mean in Brazil, one evidence of leaving a meeting upset or so on and so forth, don't be rude, that's it, it's irreconcilable. So really knowing what's important in the culture when you begin to chat with your uh, uh, colleagues and also with the governing uh, uh, authorities. Um, and then also in Brazil, come with a mindset that's gonna take time, it's gonna take lots of time. Um, the, on the DOE side, I initially proposed the project and it was three years ahead and DOE said, well, we don't do projects three years ahead. So that's fine, but if you want to do it, they said, can you move it forward? I said, no, if you want to do it in Brazil, this is my proposal. Um, so also um, a bit of negotiation on the other side in the US. Um, you know, what was kind of uh, my biggest surprise, I expected some hurdles and difficulties in Brazil. I knew I'd need a lot of time. Um, uh, but I also found, you know, Brazil, of course, has its own institutions, its own processes. Well, DOE is quite big as well and used to getting its way, but Brazil is actually bigger than DOE. So DOE had to be flexible, and, and my attempt at cajoling DOE to be uh, flexible, DOE was in the end, but that was the biggest surprise. I didn't know how many challenges there would also be in Washington. Um, I, uh, so I, I, I learned that, um, and in the end, uh, everybody showed enough flexibility for a, a successful uh, project. And kind of the last thing in Brazil is, you know, look for ways to be kind. If you're, if you're interacting with an individual and you're kind, um, that really goes a long way. So, so understanding, understanding the culture um, so that you can kind of move that uh, conversation uh, uh, forward. Um, so kind of a, a, a summary of, uh, of things that, that I learned through this uh, process. Um, um, I learned, and you know, this is to a lot of folks here with diplomatic training, that's probably uh, uh, trivial, and there are kind of two ways to learn a language, right? You can learn it in, uh, in, in school, and in university, or you can kind of be thrown in in an immersion, and each one has its uh, uh, benefits and uh, 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 disadvantages. So my diplomacy was really by uh, uh, a trial error and, and thank goodness some amount of uh, uh, success. Um, you know, the flexibility was key, key in that. How did we get past the presidential decree? Well, the Air Force colonel um, explained to us, because actually it's the Air Force that uh, approves these things um, and controls flights, uh, uh, it's a military uh, control of all flights. Um, there hadn't been a U.S. Uh, aircraft that had made it into Brazil for about 20 years for research purposes. So a lot of my colleagues told me, Scott, you know, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your time. Um, what was the key? Well, uh, the Brazilian colleagues got to know the Air Force colonel very well, and he uh, really became a partner, and he uh, had a shared common purpose with us. And finally, uh, he sat down and he said, well, you know, you only need a 
presidential decree, he finally explained the rules to us. And instead of expecting us to know the rules, he started to work with us and explained, well, you don't need that presidential decree if you take your camera off. Oh, well, okay, that's great, camera's off. So, so we weren't taking pictures. And if you're not taking pictures, then you're not a spy plane and then you don't need presidential decree. And the camera for our science purpose was relatively minor. Um, and you might have thought, I, the, he, someone might have mentioned to us that along the way, but no, he, he, uh, and, uh, he, he only mentioned to us in the end because he got involved with our project and wanted to see it uh, succeed. Um, and that's, uh, and that's, how, that's how it happened. We took, we took the camera off and, and everything was easy after that. I wish someone had told us that two years earlier. <laughs> okay, so I'm at learning, uh, uh, learning uh, and developing those relationships. So my summary on that then is uh, really identifying, you have goals when you go in, you're not gonna accomplish them all. So decide the ones that are really important. Uh, f focus on that. Um, once you decide that, be flexible. Expect that you're going to need to adapt in order to achieve uh, those goals. Um, have an openness. Um, what you really want to do, in my view, is develop uh, a sense of an, an aura of trust and uh, shared, uh, shared purpose. Um, uh, once you have that, uh, a, lot starts to, to, a lot starts to happen. The famed Brazilian bureaucracy uh, starts to find uh, they, uh, they, they have a, a, an idiom, uh, jogo de cinto. They uh, have a way uh, to make things happen, even in the famed uh, bureaucracy, once uh, everybody has this kind of shared uh, purpose, uh, so it's partner institutions, colleagues, make sure they're the ones talking to the authorities in our cases because they wanted to hear from the Brazilian colleagues, the Brazilian scientists, this is important for the Brazilian national interest. Um, they didn't want to hear that, they didn't want to hear that from us. Um, and the key currency was time, um, lots of planning, uh, uh, lots of planning ahead. So those were uh, the things uh, that I thought I would share with you about my uh, experience. Um, let you know in terms of the um, uh, data sharing, um, uh, the, the, when the end it's, uh, it's, it's wide open, anyone in this room who wants the results, um, DOE through its ARM Climate Research Facility um, maintains a web page. You can go there, uh, you can download it, um, and uh, thank you all for uh, listening. Okay, thank you very much. I invite you guys to come on up. Thank you so much, Scott. I'm going to ask you to sit down, everyone, um, but I, I, I loved it. You're, have a seat, have a seat. I love, I love the, can we, one more round of applause. I love the three stories we got here today. <laughs> and also here at the end, that Scott, that you're, you're, you're a chemical engineer, right? Uh, the training in chemistry, that's right. Chemistry, he's a chemist. Yes, that's right. But, so, but, but in doing your project that you've had to learn, um, it's a whole suite of skills. That's correct. That you never had before. Mm -hmm. And I also was thinking too that, that you, you two talked a little bit higher level, but I'm guessing that you too also would have stories of this kind of sausage making, ping ponging back and forth and building the kind of relationships, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You don't, you don't have to tell them all, but I think that, that we got some good levels here. Try working with China when you'd never been to China. I mean, uh, yeah, it's a real learning curve and uh, you know, you have to kind of constantly reinvent yourself as you go through life. But, uh, uh, you know, after five years is that uh, now I know something and, and how it works. But also uh, you can team, you know, with people. And uh, we have a very good Office of China Affairs uh, in DOE. And uh, uh, yeah, I was kind of like glued to them, uh, you know, uh, hip to hip, so to speak, uh, while we started off. But uh, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of uh, kind of trial and error, as you were saying in your talk. And, and the transaction cost, I mean, it was, it was exciting when, when the CERC got recertified, you know, another five years for the existing ones, and you're extending on. It just, the transaction costs have to be getting less. And, and I think, too, that you have, that there are people on, the, on the, the U.S. teams that actually, you know, the first level of, of encryption in working with China in, in any of these countries is the language. And so, so there's... Yeah, it is true that transaction costs are very high in the beginning because you do have to have large group meetings just to establish those kind of relationships. And, you know, think of the travel uh, it takes to, you know, say, bring 40 or so people just on one certain track uh, over to the other country and, uh, and spend a week there. Um, but uh, we were very fortunate that the research itself was funded uh, well by the Department of Energy. And uh, I make this as kind of a footnote but I think that uh, the CERC would never have been successful if we also did not have some support from the State Department. Uh, the State Department actually provided a, a small amount, as it turns out, it's about 1% of the research cost, but it was an absolutely essential uh, part of the overall budgeting of what we're doing to operate uh, what you'd call a secretariat, uh, something that would allow 
the coordination government to government to make this work. Um, and uh, if, you're, if you don't have that, uh, you can't really get started or even, you know, hold your meetings. So uh, very important to have both departments, uh, you know, support each other. And Rhonda, in some ways, for, for you, the, the Cook Stove Alliance, in some ways, you are the secretary. Yes. And you're yes. bringing these, these together. Any, you don't have you, to. I mean, you know, anytime you're trying to bring um, scientists, businesses, investment bankers, you know, together who don't always share a common lexicon, who don't share common approaches to doing things, and then you add on top of that governments in each of the countries that we're working in, of course, that's bound to have just a certain amount of confusion, you know, in terms of, of what's happening. So there's been a lot of that, that, that we've had to um, support, facilitate. And when I talked earlier about, you know, as we're looking at going from zero to 100 million by 2020, the curve is not linear, was never projected to be linear. You know, it started quite flat. We've just started to really move on the positive, sort of, you know, sharper, steeper portion of that curve in the last year or two. So the first few years were this sausage making, you know, and ensuring that each partner understood what the other was doing. There was some elements of trust that needed to be dealt with there as well. Um, again, given different approaches and, and different ways of working. And one good sort of clear example of this is the ISO process. You know, we've had uh, 26 different countries, the standards bodies of 26 different countries, come together to help contribute and develop cook stove standards. That it has been a, a very challenging task because each country has its own national interest, you know, that they're putting forward first. They have, the, but they do understand that they would like to either be able to import stoves from different countries or have their own country's manufacturers be able to export to other countries finished goods or just intermediate and raw materials. So they, there's both the national interest as well as the idea that they want to have a global you know, market be available to them and for their enterprises. So trying to have everybody come together to develop these global cook stoves, it sounds nice at the end of the day, and we're about at the end of that <laughs> process, so it's great. But, but it was extremely challenging. Um, and, and I will just say, you know, again, a second time, our colleague, Rainy Chang, who um, was a AAAS fellow, is the one managing this entire thing. So you all have some good skill sets to, <laughs> to address this. And, and I think she has seen it. It's tested her and, and pushed her boundaries you know, out a little bit further, because there is conflict resolution, you know, et cetera, all of these things that become really critical um, as you think about you know, um, as developing these as well. I think, I think, I mean, I have some more questions, but I'd like to invite the audience that we've got some microphones here. Would, some people want to leap up? Give you put that. Ah, there we go. The leaping is happening. And if you don't mind just saying your name and affiliation, and go for it. Thank you so much for your presentations today. Um, my name is Pamela Collins. I'm a current AAAS fellow at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and their Institute for Water Resources. And I was wondering if any of you might be able to comment on um, a thought that I had uh, during your presentations, which is you can do science as the goal with diplomacy as the outcome or you can use science as a tool to achieve the goal of diplomacy. And I was wondering if you might be able to comment a little bit on those two approaches and what you think about them. Thank you. I'll start maybe with a short answer so that others can chime in. Um, I, I do think that uh, when President Obama uh, and President Hu Jintao in the very beginning met, uh, and they launched uh, a clean energy set of initiatives, including the CERC, uh, that this was um, uh, a diplomatic, uh, a strategic goal that they had in mind, and they were using science as a tool uh, to accomplish it. So, however, uh, when it comes to the practical matter of uh, identifying uh, funding and research dollars, and who's going to pay for the awards after your competitive solicitation process, uh, really the essence is that you must have a value proposition for the research programs to basically secure that funding. Uh, and at that point, uh, you're going forward with a research program and you're trying to do the absolute best you can to make it productive with the hope that the diplomatic things become kind of the spillover effects uh, from a really good relationship. So it's a, it's a little bit uh, kind of symbiotic in that sense. I'm not sure that you could do one without the other. But the CERC did, was able you know, to build on you know, a lot of different kinds of bilateral clean energy cooperation that had been happening, not just with USG, but also NGOs and universities, right? 
Uh, right, and uh, I could have gone on for a lot longer, but uh, we, we have a, a long history ever since the normalization of relations in 1979 of having dozens and dozens of, uh, of projects uh, um, of, of cooperation on science and technology across almost all the missions of DOE with many, you know, just with China, but also with many other countries. So uh, we're full up on that. Uh, but uh, still, is it we, on this particular <coughs> CERC project, we did try to take it to a new level. Uh, you know, in the larger scheme of science and technology cooperation, I would say the most common one uh, is where you have information exchanges and you have relationship building on projects where people come together with common interests, but they're not necessarily integrated on the research projects. And on the other end, you have uh, the governments trying to facilitate uh, relationships between business enterprises uh, where there really, there's a lot of money there and there's a lot of interest on, on companies, but they don't really know how to kind of like form the agreement and get off the ground and do something together. And so governments have a really strong role in forming kind of what they call business to business counterfacing projects. Uh, in the middle is a little bit of a rarer thing where uh, each government is actually funding research and development that is jointly undertaken. And that's kind of where we're sitting here with this new model. Rod, so any comments you on the sciences tool? Yeah, I mean, fairly goal? similar. I, I would just say that um, from a household energy standpoint, that doesn't always, even though the science is there and, and now it's much, the evidence base is much clearer on the impact that clean energy at the household level can have. That alone doesn't win the day to, for governments to say, oh, fine, we're then going to help scale up you know, um, clean energy at, at the household level. So that's where diplomacy and relationships really do play a key part. So a, a great example, again, it's a US-China example of Secretary Clinton um, really pushing this notion of, you know, with the Chinese of, you know, we already have energy cooperation, but it doesn't seem to extend to the household level. We've got science, we've got the evidence base, we've got data that says quite clearly how this can impact air pollution for you in China and you know the air isn't just limited in China obviously it's you know it's going to affect all of us sort of globally as well so why don't we work collaboratively to be able to prioritize this just as we have done you know energy efficient buildings transportation etc so that's where diplomacy I think can give that additional push to prioritize something that that science has made quite clear, but it hasn't necessarily reached a priority level for, for government. So it is symbiotic that way, um, where diplomacy can help just push things um, a little bit further. What about your thoughts, Scott? On so I, I guess I would add uh, two, two things to that. One, if uh, the point is better relations or, uh, or diplomacy, um, and one views science as the tool, well, presumably you want to have a successful uh, diplomacy. So uh, what I mean by that is uh, make sure, and this is to reiterate what uh, uh, Bob said, make sure that the science is really there. Um, you want it to be a high level science, you want it to be uh, calls, open, uh, open peer review, challenging. Um, at the end of the day, that uh, provides a um, worthwhile science project that then translates into those good feelings that are associated with diplomacy, which then can translate into a number of other uh, avenues in the relationships between uh, two, two countries. Um, the other thing I would comment on is uh, we often think of, I think, diplomacy uh, as a kind of, uh, well, I, well, I should say, I'm, I'm a neophyte, so I think of diplomacy as often represented as somewhat top-down from uh, the president to uh, the, the secretary to the diplomatic corps. Um, I would like there to be avenues for it to be bottom up as well. So uh, for example, we have uh, just concluded the Go Amazon experiment for two years. Um, the con concept of the Go Amazon experiment is an arm mobile facility, so it moves. It's going now to Ascension uh, uh, Island. Um, it's a great program. One of the outcomes of that program is that uh, we have a lot of serious relationships between leading scientists um, in the two uh, communities. Uh, one of the scientists, for example, the Brazilians, Brazilian scientists, he just received a major award yesterday, the kind of the Medal of Honor equivalent he, from uh, President uh, Rousseff. We have leading Brazilian scientists involved who are engaged, interested. We have them on the U.S. side as well. But that sounds great. We have no vehicle to continue that. Um, so that established uh, set of contacts uh, over the last two years um, now will uh, decay, decay away. So when you're thinking about diplomacy, thinking also about ways that existing networks can uh, harness opportunities or make proposals to diplomats or so on and so forth, so that it's a two-way street. 
Did, but has has your but your so but your work has been recognized? I mean, at higher levels. I mean, I love the. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of you very much. I like the contrast, more the bottom up. You know, swashbuckling out in the field, making the diploma and and, and filling out forms, kind of uh, diplomacy happening. Yeah, no, it certainly has been recognized uh, as one of the highlight items for the two uh, exchanges that uh, Jilma and uh, Obama uh, have had. Um, it's been a fantastic project, and the kind of question is, what's the, what, now that we've established so many relationships, what are the avenues for continuity, continued building? Um, that wasn't part of the original description of the project. The project's doing exactly what it said it would do. It takes the uh, facility, two years of fantastic measurements, and it's a mobile facility, and then it moves. So then, the, but that does leave the question of, okay, now that it has so many accomplishments, so many relationships, um, how could that be harnessed in a diplomatic sense? And, and we scientists have a basic feeling that it should be harnessable, but we don't know how to answer that question. Okay, well, I think we'll circle back to that. I have another question we are waiting in the wings. Uh, thank you, all three of you, for your wonderful presentations. It's really nice to hear your stories. Uh, my name is Rapella Zama, and I'm the Director of International Affairs at the Royal Society, which is the UK's National Science Academy. Um, I have two questions, one for Bob and one for Radha. Um, could Bob, you speak could, up? Yeah, could you could speak you, into the I, microphone a little more? We're having hard to right, hear it. Right, Just close. right up close. Yeah. Bob, you talked about thank you. Um, a cultural shift in this form of collaboration, moving from a traditional model to a more collaboration plus model, and I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about how that you achieved that cultural shift. Where did it come from? Was it from the leadership? Where does that impulse come from for that change? Um, my question for Radha, um, Radha, I'm so inspired by what you've managed to achieve since 2010. Um, my question is an operational one. Do you start by setting those really broad and ambitious goals and working backwards on how you get there, or, or is it more of a kind of an ad hoc process which is easier to kind of set out six years on? I'm kind of interested in how you get such a mega program um, going. I guess that's to me. <laughs> the, the, the second one was, for, well, yeah, in some ways, you, start with that? you can start with that, and in sure. some ways it's, yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of the goals, you know, I have, I have a funny story to tell you because um, the our global alliance partners, there were 19 founding partners, um, was were coming together in early 2010. I hadn't joined the alliance at that point, and um, and there we there was an opportunity to launch it. There was a discussion about launching in September or launching in 2011, and the opportunity came up in September at the Clinton Global Initiative. And so Secretary Clinton decided herself, Lisa Jackson, some of the European donors. Um, Diffid, et cetera, uh, to be a part of it, and they would they would launch it. And um, and what I understand is the night before there was oh we have to have a goal. What are we going to say? What is, what is this initiative going to do? <laughs> and so um, so there was the so they came up with the fact that you know there are 500 million households as I mentioned out there the need. This is a new concept taking a market based approach to achieving this. So let's say that we it's a concept that should be tested, and if it can be scaled up, then at least 20 percent of the market should be addressed via this concept. So so that's where the 100 million target came from. Um, you know, it was a few months of discussion, but nonetheless, you know, this notion of what should we put out there. So it did start up as a top-down, in that sense, goal. Let's just say we want to address 20% of the market, and if this approach works for 20% of the market, surely it can then be scaled up, you know, to the rest of the market. So that's how that number started. I came on board a few months after that and said, okay, let me work with this 100 million number and let's break it down. And so we started to look at the different countries that had over 30% solid fuel use for cooking. At the time in 2011, there were over 55 countries who, that had more than 30% solid fuel use for cooking. And we then looked at a number of different variables and narrowed it down to what we have currently, which is eight focus countries, uh, where we have a very comprehensive set of activities to be able to achieve our target. And in those countries, we actually said, okay, let's put the 100 million aside and let's look at what's manageable within each of these countries, more from a bottom-up approach. And so that's where we, you know, we, we did end up getting a portfolio that added up to roughly 100 million. Although, as I said now, I think we will be able to overshoot that, um, you know, in terms of uh, what we're able to do. So we still align with obviously the vision of 100 million households, but we do have a clear kind of country action plan that is bought into by all of the stakeholders working in that country 
government as well as non-government and, and private sector actors. And there is a country action plan that we revisit every few years to say, are we still on track? Are we not? You know, what do we need to do more of, less of, et cetera? And we keep updating those targets in terms of what is achievable within each of those countries. Uh, what's also interesting is the fuel mix. Like in China, our biggest effort was to really to shift away from coal for cooking to either pellets or to LPG or electricity, cleaner forms of fuel. Um, fairly similar sort of approach in India, although biomass we knew was going to continue to be used, so having more efficient biomass burning stoves, but then also supporting the government with its efforts to transition more to gas for cooking in, in particular. And Prime Minister Modi just two days ago made huge announcement about 50 million Indian households now shifting to gas for, for cooking based on some of the pilots and things like that that we and others have been engaged in over the last few years. So, so bottom line, it started top down, but in order to make this real and to have ownership and buy-in and for others to feel that there was a concrete plan, it was really developed uh, bottom up in country. And that's what made it credible with donors and investors alike, because everyone likes a vision. You always need that to, to, you know, to move towards that, but you need something incredibly concrete for people to invest in, and that's been developed bottom up. I see another question waiting on the wings here. Hi, good morning. My name is Daniel Gomez. I come from the Embassy of Colombia. Um, and, and try to speak as close as you can to the mic. That's sure. going to hear you well. Well, I was going to ask two questions, but, but one of them was already answered. It was focused on Rada's work, which is very impressive, I must say, especially in a country like my own, which suffers from several problems of uh, food security. Uh, so thank you very much for your work, uh, as well as doctors. Um, my question, since I come from the other side, not the scientific, but the diplomatic, I would like to ask, what exactly do you expect from the diplomatic community in terms of and for getting your work enforced. Uh, we serve as a diplomatic channel, as an information channel from uh, the, the government we act for and the government we are uh, credited in. So what do you expect, actually? What can we do for you to get your projects enforced in, in our countries? <laughs> okay. That's a good question. That's an excellent question. I'd expect nothing less from a AAAS audience. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So. Um, of course, uh, we expect a lot, actually, uh, <laughs> uh, particularly from uh, the people in the consulates and the embassies. Uh, um, every time uh, we have a meeting, uh, the officers there are, are totally engaged uh, in our trip to identify uh, the right people that we need to work with, uh, make sure that we have the right language services. Uh, a lot of times there's just nuances about what's going on in the communities uh, that are very, very helpful. But uh, I'll just give uh, one rather dramatic example. Um, it may not uh, be at the, at the uh, junior level of a Foreign Service officer, but uh, certainly at the senior level, which is that um, we uh, really did want compliance uh, with our intellectual property agreement. And uh, one of our companies uh, was saying that uh, they were working with uh, a partner which uh, seemed from their perspective to be overreaching and going outside of the boundaries of the technology framework that we had created. Uh, and uh, the deal was uh, kind of stagnating uh, and it was very important uh, to both sides. Uh, and it, it turned out that, uh, that Ambassador Locke uh, uh, learned of this and um, uh, he made a trip to the governor of the province uh, and said, look, we." We have a paper here that's uh, in Chinese. It's signed by the leaders in Beijing. Uh, it's endorsing another document that's in Chinese. Uh, would you please read these uh, and, uh, and see what you can do? And uh, the governor of the province could clearly see that this was a, a Beijing initiative, not just a provincial or a, a, kind of a dispute between companies, uh, but there was something uh, larger at stake here. Uh, and uh, uh, it was very, very helpful. Uh, within days, really, is that uh, negotiations were back on track and it was really a dispute over whether it was going to be an exclusive license or a non-exclusive license. And in the end, uh, non-exclusive was required by the TMP, uh, which gave the company some flexibility then to look for other partners, not just have one in China. So this is a case where we have things, but uh, from our perch in the United States, uh, we're just not capable of, uh, of, of making that reach. Uh, and Ambassador Locke was, was very helpful in that case. Nada? 
I think I would just uh, add, you know, definitely access, you know, information on the ground, information, et cetera, as, as Bob mentioned, I think all, all very important. The one thing to add on top of that, I think what's really interesting that a Ministry of Foreign Affairs or a State Department, if it's in the United States, the role that they play is an interlocutor with the other ministries and the other agencies. Um, so I think that's often critical for a cross-cutting issue. Um, you know, of course, I'm talking about stoves here, but it, it, it relates to a whole host of other issues. It doesn't just reside within a ministry. Ministry of Energy. There's a role to be played by Ministry of Gender, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Environment, Power, et cetera. So often the diplomacy that can come from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Embassy ends up being critical in helping facilitate all of those other relationships, you know, even though a particular country, you know, may have a just sort of bilateral relationship with one of the ministries that they're, they're particularly engaged in. So I think that is another role that I think diplomacy can play. The other thing we've seen is taking things to scale from the local to the national to the global levels and platforms. That's something that diplomacy and, and can, can play a huge role in as well. So if you're seeing successes in a particular country in terms of clean energy having impact, to ensure that that then is included in the country's INDC, you know, or included as part of their SDG objectives. Those are things that, you know, the individual scientists or the individual organization can't play, but the role of, of the diplomat or in particular, I think, a role of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in each country can play quite significantly to ensure this doesn't stay within a particular area, but actually has, um, you know, has uh, has a place in a lot of other international platforms as well. So, um, in our uh, particular case, what I'll add is that the State Department was uh, extremely uh, helpful. The uh, embassy, um, uh, the communication with the uh, Brazilian Air Force was through the military attaché uh, at the, uh, uh, the U.S. military attaché at the Brazilian embassy or the U.S. embassy in Brasilia, and uh, um, um, he was he was superb. Um, you know, okay, so standing back from that and asking the big picture, it won't surprise you that uh, scientists would say, well, uh, sw uh, sw sweep away as many obstacles as possible to let us do uh, our job. And of course, people in the diplomatic corps, uh, you're not, you're, you, you are there uh, to uh, enforce the laws of whatever country, whether it's the U.S., Brazil, Colombia, so on and so forth. Um, so I, uh, I think, uh, we would beseech, and this would have to be at the highest level, um, as many open science uh, agreements as possible um, uh, with the idea that uh, those science agreements involve a lot of local uh, partners in, in each country. And um, scientists trying to go from those countries to the U.S. are often frustrated. Scientists trying to go from the U.S. to those countries are often frustrated. Um, and to the extent that we could live in a better world that had more open uh, exchange, that would really facilitate, I think, both the science and the diplomacy. Some good messages coming from up front here. And yes, All right, sir. I guess we get one last question to set up this afternoon sessions, because if you know this, there's a lot of discussion about Iran in and building bridges. Uh, with a country that has its own scientific establishment and its own set of problem issues with climate and energy. And energy. I was wondering if any of you have a quick comment based on your own experience uh, that you would see for, going in, for working with a country where these bridges do not exist. <laughs> um, I have had no direct uh, involvement uh, you know, with Iran. Um, I am on a joint board uh, with Egypt, but I think if you've read the papers, uh, you could see the really important role that Secretary Ernie Moniz played in negotiating uh, the nuclear deal with Iran. And I believe that was because uh, you had essentially uh, two physicists uh, that really knew what they were doing in terms of how to uh, prevent the avenues uh, to bomb building uh, because they were trained. I mean, uh, Secretary Moniz is a physicist uh, from MIT. Um, when I was doing my PhD at MIT, uh, we had 100 uh, uh, Iranian students uh, in my program, uh, in the nuclear program there. Uh, they were part of a program at the time that was uh, organized by the Shah before the revolution. Uh, but. Uh, uh, there were relationships that were built at MIT during that period. And uh, as it turns out, is that uh, Secretary Moniz knew uh, the leading negotiator in the Iranian side uh, because of that 
relationship then, and uh, they both uh, were talking terms that, quite frankly, diplomats uh, really couldn't fathom. <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, the relationship that the Secretary of Energy formed with the Secretary of State, that formed with the President and the National Security Council, uh, I think came to um, uh, an agreement that has held a lot of water, uh, even though you have a lot of people with a lot of scrutiny and expertise digging very deeply to find flaws, is that uh, so? Um, that's about all I can say. Is that I, I think that the science part of that agreement was absolutely crucial, uh, you know, to uh, to making it happen and and uh, having it uh, withstand scrutiny. Just nothing <laughs> So uh, I guess what, what I would say is uh, two uh, kind of real world examples that could provide a template. Um, the uh, uh, Chinese government for quite a long time has had a Chinese scholarship uh, committee. This is uh, a way for uh, st people at many levels, uh, graduate students, um, uh, also uh, uh, professors, to come to the United States and spend a certain amount of time here that the Chinese government is paying for. I received a number of those individuals into, uh, into my group. Um, I, I think that that's been uh, a successful. That's kind of building up relationships that translate in many ways into diplomacy. Um, Joma Rousseff launched about, I would say maybe eight years ago, uh, a science mobility program, Science Without Borders. Um, and she called it the Brazilian mission to the moon. That was how she called it. She did an analogy to the 1960s Kennedy uh, 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 statement. And this has led to um, um, tens of thousands of Brazilians going abroad and uh, uh, studying. Um, I think then also that it uh, um, promotes um, understanding between the two countries. I will tell you that I get once a day a request from someone from Tehran to come work uh, in my group. Um, I haven't responded positively to those. Um, I'm not familiar with Iran. Um, um, there is the uh, 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 overlap of thinking about, well, if someone were to come from Iran, how would this be in the visa? Um, a lot of complications. If all of that is now easier because of this recent agreement, um, and in addition, if one were to um, decide, okay, we'll now have a, a funded science exchange program, um, that would lead to science exchange. And if that's considered a good thing in the diplomatic context, that would be a, a mechanism that uh, has shown success in recent years with respect to China, U.S., and Brazil, U.S. So I would encourage that to be uh, explored um, and if considered valuable in diplomatic context, implemented. Certainly, folks from uh, 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 Tehran are very well respected for their training in uh, mathematics and chemistry and uh, mm -hmm. physical sciences. Um, I think uh, a number of folks in the United States would be happy uh, to host them in their, in their laboratories for mutual benefit. And the fact that you know we know from your story today that you do have a black belt in paperwork, and that, that you would be <laughs> a prime person to make this work. So I think we got time for one last um, quick question for yes, the group. Um, Hi, my name is Cecilia Floco. I'm from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and I work also as a scientific ambassador and liaison between research projects between Latin America and Europe. Um, well, my question was in part replied already by Dr. Scott. And I, w I was thinking in the project that you commented, and I was doing the exercise of thinking the opposite. Uh, scientists from Latin America or other countries coming to the state to do that type of research and needed access to all those institutions that you explained. Would it have been easier in terms of bureaucracy? And if so, which lessons we could learn from that to apply for future projects? Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Humboldt Foundation. <laughs> you funded uh, partially a sabbatical in 2008 for me for some work in the Amazon. We are generous, <laughs> so somebody's interested. <laughs> but uh, well, yeah. Uh, I don't. Humboldt had a historical interest, as you know, in the Amazon uh, region. But um, yeah, so as part of this program, uh, I meant to mention it. I guess I didn't get to it in my notes. Um, on the U.S. side, um, uh, a number of scientists have received students from Brazil as a result of this project, as a result of two things. One, establishing the connection with uh, faculty colleagues in Brazil and therefore learning about the students and therefore being receptive to hosting students. And then with the science mobility program being enabled financially to uh, receive those students. Um, that 
has been just a lucky alignment of the stars because the Brazilian government at this time, or during that time, um, ha was really providing a large level of funding and uh, places people were just needing uh, uh, hosts. So um, if we think uh, that that wasn't the normal situation, meaning that wasn't the situation 10 years before and it's no longer the situation uh, now, um, what could uh, be done to continue to facilitate those uh, exchanges? I think it starts not with advertising an available program. I think the real worthwhile exchanges start by establishing relationships between scientists in two countries, and they establish a project, and then they say, oh, this interests us. Let's find a bridge, a student, um, and then funding associated with that. So, so I would say to start with the relationship between scientists. Mm -hmm. but Thank you. That is at the level of students. I mean, if you need to reach all the aviation, uh, everything that you were saying before, how, how it would be here? Could it be easier? Or so I, you, you, you needed access to mm -hmm. a certain level of oh. uh, things in the government in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That case in the States would be different, would be easier? Do you find the same uh, bureaucratic uh, blocks? or? Oh, so how would we approach the State Department and this yes. type of thing? I might refer that to uh, <laughs> someone else yes. on the committee or, to answer, because I don't have the answer for it. Okay. <laughs> but we could probably help find someone to get that kind of answer, right, hopefully. But yeah, but actually, we, we have hit up against the time. And you guys were so good to be here on time at the beginning. So is, it, is that OK? So, so I, I want to thank all of you. First of all, thank the speakers for, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like humble. These are science diplomats in front of me, science, science and diplomacy experts here. And thank AAAS Center for Science Diplomacy and Michael for kind of bringing all this little new happy family together here on the panel. And uh, yeah, could have one more hand of applause to our, to our good speakers today. And thank you, Jennifer. Thank you.